What is up, y'all? Welcome back to the channel. It's time for episode 40 of Tiger's Franchise. We sit on the cusp of the 2028 season. It's February 8th in game time. We've definitely got some things to go over, y'all. Uh, obviously, as we are this deep, free agency has been going. You can see here that Edwin Diaz, Jonathan India, Joe Ryan, Erod, Rendon are the top guys. I jumped in here. Um, I don't want to say because of bad news, but because of a slight annoyance, but I've got other things to get to as well. We're also on the cusp in real life of the Lions playing against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for a chance to host a divisional game for the NFC Championship. That's unbelievable to me. I am so excited. I really, really, really hope they beat the Bucs. Then they will host the Packers. I, I don't even know how I'd react, but first things first, they got to win this game. In a little while, it's gonna start here, but we've got some time to get into our Tigers. So, when I last left y'all, I talked about looking at a couple free agents. Problem was, was where they fit. They, they were outfielder types. Uh, Jung Hoo Lee being chief among them. And I was just like, I, I don't need, I don't know. I don't know if I've got a, uh, a spot for the grandson of wind. He's awesome. But where do we really put him? Our outfield is pretty good, and he's not going to come cheaply. Not that he couldn't improve our team, but was it the best use of money? And as you can see from this purple background here, uh, he signed with the Rockies, which is awesome. I've actually seen him sign with the Rockies multiple times, uh, both in this year's game and last year's. O over the two games, I've seen maybe th this might be the third signing with Colorado that he's done. The first two were amazing. So this has a chance to pan out very, very well for Colorado. For once, they do something right now. They signed him to a colossal deal, eight years of buck 72. So right as I praise them, I kind of look, I kind of look askew at this and say, well, you, you did, okay. you know, pat him on the head. You did okay, Colorado, you, you did okay. It's not that he can't be great, but he's already 29. You know, if they did this in real life this past year, it would be aggressive. Um, you know, the Giants signed him, I think, to a six-year deal, but he's also 26. So it's quite a bit different, or even 25. So it's quite a bit different than when he comes over at 2028 20, and you still give him the eight years. But either way, I don't, I don't hate the signing. He's a good player. He just didn't really fit with us. So there was also the guy, um, Mamenyo, I, I believe, and he had an awesome nickname that one of y'all pointed out that I didn't even point out. Oh, what? Oh, man, what was his name? Wasn't it M-A-M? -M? Or Menino. Menino. Was that it? Boom. Ajuma Menino. Nicknamed Fly By Night. But another outfielder. And going for a similar price, at least for this year, about 14 mil, 13, 7 to the Giants. Now, he's only for a three-year deal. The last year's a player option. So this was more affordable. He's 24. We could have figured this one out. What's interesting, though, is... Oh, they're going to put him at first. Okay. Because I'm seeing his infield ratings, even though he only has left and right. They're just going to stick him over at first. Yeah, first DH, that's the thing too. He didn't bring any defensive value. And for that, I usually want power. Now, this is a very cool bat. It does everything but, and it does it very well. And I do think that Menino would have been a fit in our park. Because we do have some great power alleys. He's a left-handed batter. Uh, so he'd have eaten up that triples alley with the 80 gap. I, I believe he could have hit double digit triples, which you don't really see anymore these days outside of an occasional spike. Menino could have been that guy for us, but we passed on him. I don't regret it. I just wanted to check in, show y'all where he went. You know what? I'm going to put him on. Let's put him on. Um, let's just put him on the default list. I don't have a list for like guys I want to follow. So the default list will function as that because I'm curious to see how things go with him. I'll also get a new scout in because I'd like to see uh, this go up from average and see what, what this profile rounds into. So what have we done? Those two outfielders were probably the cream of the crop outside of one other guy. And um, I just didn't need outfield, so I didn't go for that. I took a swing, y'all. I took a swing and I had really, really psyched myself into it. And then I got I got smoked. I got the rug pulled out from under me. I went back to the well, and I was going to bring back Shosei Watanabe. 
and I gave him a nice one year, $19 million offer. He was interested, you know, I submitted it. Okay, we'll go 119. I thought that was kind of the perfect fit. Was gonna train him to play a little third. Even though he's only got a 40 arm, I was gonna at least get third base on his ledger. So that way he could bounce around and kind of, kind of be super utility, which I, I do put in quotes. Oh, I guess he, he has a zero at third base. So that would have been bad. Like, like not even, not even a chance. Surely he could have been at least a 40 over there. I don't believe that he's truly a zero, but usually it shows what they could be when you do a compare like this. But either way, um, even if he had been playing first and second, that would have been fine. I was, I was gonna bring him in, take another shot on him, do the one year thing. And I didn't even get a up your offer situation. It was, he's interested, he's looking at it, boom, signs with the Nats. Now in fairness to Watanabe, he got five years 78 from them. That was the right move for him. So I, I have no ill will toward him. I was just, you know, you know when you psych yourself up for something uh, that you weren't necessarily initially interested in and then you've kind of come all the way around, you're like, yes, actually I love this, this is gonna work. That's where I was with this Watanabe move. So I was pretty bummed when I think literally a game day later or two, it was very short time, I go to look at the pending offers and he was gone, I was like, oh, he signed. And I didn't even get an email about it. Wow, that's surprising. Yeah, dummy, because he didn't sign with you. Because surely if he had signed, the, the fan interest would have gone up. So uh, that was a little bit of a bummer. I was like, okay, fine. So then I'm sitting here and I'm looking at the club and I'm just like, we got to do something in one spot. I look over the lineup. I feel pretty good about where things are. I look at the pitching as a composite. I feel pretty good, but if there's one place we could upgrade, I think it is with an ace pitcher. Another thing is we had all this money and nowhere to spend it. So for me, I was thinking trade was gonna be the best way to actually spend this money so that we don't just lose it all. And then the team gets more expensive next year, but Chris Hillich says, well, you didn't need that much last time, so here's 50 bucks. So I was like, we need to go out, pull out a trade, get somebody who is awesome, but costs some money. So that way we can spend this money here and make sure we keep things rolling properly. So I went and found a deal, y'all. I went and found a deal. And I am really excited about this one. As y'all know, my name is of course, Paul Sporer, and uh, I'm partial to people who are Paul S's. Paul, Paul Splitorf was a pitcher when I was younger. Paul Spoljarek. First off, those two both were Paul SPs. So I was I was a big fan of those. You know, for Spoljarek, it's S-P-O. So he's really getting close to my name there. But I've always been partial to the Paul S's in sports. There aren't that many. But there is one who recently came into baseball. And some of y'all are racking your brain, you can't figure it out. Others of you have definitely figured out that it is indeed Paul M.F. in Skeens. We got Skeens, y'all. Check this out. He is a monster. He's coming off of three straight full seasons, an excellent debut in 20, or excuse me, not an excellent debut, um, 5, 5.51 ERA, tough debut. You know, rookie growing pains debut. Got better the second year, got excellent the third, and was pretty good last year, 428, 132. Kind of your innings eater, workhorse type season that didn't go his way but the skills were still there. I'm trying to figure out, oh yeah. So the home run rate spiked to 1.3, the highest since that rookie year, and the BABIP was at 338. Those two things together uh, pushed his ERA well well be, uh, beyond what his skills suggested because a 21% strikeout minus walk is excellent. Um, and the 361 FIP says he should have been better. So we had no reservations about bringing him in um, based off of, you know, the, the elevated ERA. He is a monster. He is a true frontliner, 65 stuff, 55 movement, 55 control. All three pitches are 70 plus with 97 to 99 velo. One thing I still don't quite get is how the damn stuff rating is calculated. In what universe is this not at least a 70 stuff? You have three pitches that are all 70 grade or better, the fastball being 75. It also is 97 to 99 on the velo. What am I missing? I don't know, OSA, 
doesn't think so either. Whatever, it's fine. I know that 65 stuff with 55 movement and control will be a good pitcher. So the question is, what did we have to give? Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh was motivated to move him. I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, let's go look at Pittsburgh real quick. They're not a terrible team. At least they weren't this past year. I believe they were 81 and 81. So they're like, you know, they're middling, literally the definition thereof. Uh, they were 83 and 79 the year before that. So two years here where they're like 500 or right around, they're playing better, but they haven't really gotten over the hump. Um, the preseason has clicked over. So now we are in the 2028 season. So I can't see their team stats from last year, but it was strong pitching with some offensive needs. So I tried to meet that a little bit with this trade. And you got to give to get. Let's see what y'all think of what we gave. Let's go ahead and pull it up here. Let's go back to schemes. Go to this page. History. So we ended up giving five players. Javier Osorio, Dury Carrasco, Rogelio Saravia, Franklin DaCosta, and Clark Elliott. Not massive pieces, but two legit prospects. Two younger, like, you know, major league types. Actually, and then three younger major league types. I, well, Carrasco, Carrasco's 28, so he's not that young. But then DaCosta and Elliott, 27 and 26. Oh, no, both 27. So I guess if they're younger major league types, then I guess Carrasco is at 28. They're on the right side of 30. How about that? Everyone's on the right side of 30 and two prospects. So the way this started was they were really keen on Saravia and Osorio. Rogelio Saravia is a scouting discovery that we had that has a 70 potential. And I know we are starved for prospects, y'all. But when I see somebody who's 19 and already a first base only prospect, to me, that is a free trade chip. I rarely, rarely hang on to these guys unless we get them at a point where they're already like 22 and, and pretty developed, you know, maybe out of college or something. Other than that, if like when they're scouting discoveries that, that go the way of the international uh, market, I, I'm trading these guys all day. Uh, not 100%. I, I can recall. I can't even remember the name. There was one guy. Was it in the Montreal? No, because there was one in the Montreal one that I traded just like this too. Maybe I don't ever. Maybe it is 100%. But either way, I usually look at these guys as free trade chips. So if they've got juice in the market, I'm going to squeeze because it's not really a big loss to me because we don't know how close he's gonna get to any of this uh, development, and he has no defensive value. He was the main piece for them. They were excited about Sarabia. Okay, have fun. Um, Osorio was next. This is another guy. Now, he's not quite free. He is a prospect. He was in our AAA, and he has defensive value with a 75i. So I like some things that he has, but I don't value him where the, where the, um, where the league does. He's the 84th ranked prospect in baseball, one of our only top 100 guys. I think Shigoya is our other one. And I don't know, man, like, I think he's ready to be in the majors and I just didn't really have a spot for him. I guess he could have been the guy that took that Gage Workman spot. It could have been between those two, but Workman's already 28. He's got 60 range to Osorio's 50. Oh no, Osorio has 60 as well, pardon me. Osorio actually has a better defensive profile. So I, I could have used him, but I, I kind of was start starting to see him in that same view of like a free trade chip. And and again, not to the same level of Saravia. I We could have used him this year. He was on the cusp, but I didn't see him as a foundational piece for us, even with that amazing eye. Usually I would go crazy over that eye, but what else does he bring with it? I don't know. I just don't get the warm and fuzzies about this profile and yet he's a top 100 guy, teams like him. So those two were the linchpins, Osorio and Saravia. Um, then I was like, well, obviously that's not gonna get it done. Let's start adding pieces. Added Carrasco, that didn't really do much. Added Elliot, they, you know, the, the text that they tell you changes. That doesn't always mean that you're closer. Sometimes I interpret it that way if the message that they tell you is a little softer and it felt like it was. So I did the make this work. DaCosta was in it. Bada bing, bada boom, we got Paul Skeens. So catch back up on Carrasco. He only played 58 games with us in the majors last year. He kind of looks like Osorio from an offensive standpoint with less defense. But he's still, like I said, on the right side of 30. There's a universe where he's like a 
solid two win type of guy in a full major league season. But obviously the upper half of this batting profile going 40, 50, 45 in your contact gap and home run, it's light. It's really light. Everything is based on the plate skills. And I don't think he has great defensive value, right? You can you can hide him at second uh, or in a corner outfield, and then anything else is kind of pressed. And then Clark Elliott was a guy that really helped us out last year, really covered uh, nicely when we had some injuries, including to Riley Green. He ended up with a 102 WRC+. Plus, but if I could isolate the time that he played for Riley Green, I want to say he was closer to 120. He, he was really nice, and then he smoothed out. Uh, as regression set in when he was in a backup role. But he was good enough that even when Green came back, we made room to keep Elliott up because he had done so well. Uh, 361 OBP was very helpful. Only a 380 slug and a 279 average is pretty good. Uh, not bad played skills, like solid. Nice, solid corner outfielder, can play center in a pinch. Went to the University of Michigan, so he it wasn't quite a hometown boy. He was born in Illinois, but you know, when you go to college in the state that you play for, it's a little bit of a uh, local guy makes good, local-ish. Where you go to college, I think, is a big factor in your life. Like, I grew up in Michigan. Um, I've lived in Texas now longer than I lived in Michigan. But even, like, when I went to college, those four years, I hadn't, I hadn't yet eclipsed the line of being more Texan than Michigander. But because of, you know, the formative years of being at college made me feel closer to uh you know to, to to being a texan so i don't know how much clark elliott was like oh i'm a, I'm a michigander now because i went to michigan but at least that's how i felt uh going to the university of texas here in austin which by the way for those of you who don't know austin's not not like the rest of texas just so you know uh anyway clark elliott also included and then like i said da costa was kind of the final piece gives them a legit starter he's 50 50 55 like not a great starter mind you Oh, wait, actually, that's as a reliever. What's he go down to? He goes down to 45 stuff. So he's not like a stud starter or anything, but I felt I felt like I had to give them an arm somewhere. And when I did the make this work, he was there. He's 27, solid lefty. There you go. So was it enough for an ace? I don't, I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. But Pittsburgh was motivated and I wanted to get this done. Um, in fact, I was like, maybe I should add one more piece. I couldn't find that one piece to just kind of tack on to make it uh, feel a little bit better. I don't think it's nothing. I guess the reason it doesn't sting is because I don't hold Osorio and Saravia in super high regard for our future. So that's why it feels like I kind of got away with one here getting skeins. You might be noticing if you're looking at the screen that we got a second player. His name is Kanye Bloodsaw. And that was the only reason I got him was his name. Now, it, it's a bummer that Kanye, um, you know, Kanye West, the, the musician, is a total sack of shit. Just a fucking piece of garbage. Uh, it's a huge bummer. So that name now is, is pretty ugly. But Kanye Bloodsaw is a hilarious name. So I got him thrown in. That didn't move the needle at all. We didn't have to add anybody. I just thought it'd be funny to get somebody named Kanye Bloodsaw. It is unfortunate. Like, obviously, everything that Kanye has done to destroy his reputation in recent time um, is all his own fault. That's that's the bad part. Um, the minor annoyance part is that this game generates a lot of Kanye's, and uh, I no longer like enjoy that piece of it. I, I, I'm hand up, you know easily will admit I was a huge Kanye fan before he came out to be the piece of shit that he is uh, currently. But um, we had a, we had one with our Reds, a guy named Kanye Gaything, and he ended up being a stud player. And that was right around the time that all the crap was going on with Kanye. And I was like, uh, this would be more fun if, if he wasn't such a terrible person. But anyway, so that's the deal. We got Skeens. That was our big off-season move because he's coming in making 13 mil this year, and then he's in arbitration estimate. His arbitration estimate for next year is 21 mil. So that was a way for us to spend money without going out and signing somebody. He's only going to be age 26 season, and we've got him for two more years after this. That's that's the really interesting part here too. So we've got two more after this at 21 and 25. At least that's what the estimates are. So 
That was our huge move. Really excited about that one. We finally have a bankable ace. I love what Scooble has been able to do. I've called him our ace. He's still going to get opening day. But with the 40 movement, he was always he was always just shy of an ace. And I know I've talked about it on this uh, series and on my Twitch and on my podcast, anywhere that you hear me or, or read me with, uh, with my writing. I talk about how every team has a number one, but not every team has an ace. And, you know, I call him our ace because he's put on the innings to get kind of that that tag sort of, but he's more of a number one than an ace because he has a real weakness. And then the rest of our guys that, you know, Enriquez, maybe he's your ace. He has back-to-back -back sub three ERAs. Yeah, but it's in 133 and 164 innings respectively. That's not quite ace. And we all have our own definition of ace. Um, that's another thing that makes it kind of impossible to define. And, and for me, I might have guys who are not aces that other people would. For example, Enriquez, I'm sure some people would say, no, that's an ace, dude. He's been amazing. Nah, for me, you got to go at least a buck 80. And I know that that's a pretty low threshold um, in the grand scheme of baseball. But for today's game, a buck 80 or more. And then, you know, kind of a consistent low to mid three ZRA production with a solid whip, you know, 115 and below on the whip. So we've gotten great seasons out of Enriquez, out of Scooble. Gavin Stone's been really nice, had a great season last year. But we didn't have that bankable ace, that guy that we could realistically look at for seven plus damn near every time out. Skeens fills that. Skeens fills that, and I'm excited. So what else have we gotten done here? Because obviously we are in mid-February. I will point out that through whatever sorts of moves and obviously the skeins one was a big help we are now at a 80 oh wait we dropped okay we, we were at an 88 uh, fan interest at the start of preseason we did lose four points i think i mentioned this at the very outset of the episode i'm joining in right now instead of closer to the beginning of spring training because i'm a little bummed i was going to come on review the skeins stuff and then get into some of these remaining free agents because you might notice here again if you're not a second screening which is just uh you know doing something else while listening to me if you're actually watching you see that we have 24 million dollars left i don't know where the fuck that money's gonna go so what i was going to do was push it to about february 20th so that'd be four days before spring come on talk with y'all and then say hey maybe we should bring back willie adamas literally it was this was on february 7th on february 8th we get the note that the fans are mad that he's gone and he signed with the white Sox. i'm pretty bummed about that i was just about to do it i was like i'll do this on on video let's record this but let's move a little further along not only that but it's under 10 mil i was going to give him 12 it's a one-year deal, which is what I wanted to give him. The only thing I would have not wanted was a promised starting lineup role. But I think giving him 12 versus the nine and a half he got from uh, the White Sox, I think that would have helped. And so I'm kind of bummed about that. I, I really, I really am pissed. because I And I would have even spent all the money, but it would have been a nice little chunk, uh, half the money there. And he could have been kind of our, our super util type guy. You know, giving Wilman Diaz a nice backup if he's not quite ready. Uh, he could back up Cruz over at third. He could even give Brooks Lee a day off. Like, it would have been great. It would have been perfect. Because Gage Workman has the glove to be a solid backup, but he has a terrible bat. 35 avoid K is horrendous, y'all, especially with a 40 contact. So I thought that would have been a good fit. And now I'm like, oh, that really sucks. That was kind of the last guy that could really fill that role that we have. Nicky Lopez has 70 range. I don't care. I'm not interested. Nico Horner has 65. Maybe he could be that guy, but he's not even going to cost shit. Yeah, he's a minor league deal with a major league option for four mil. Like, sure, maybe, but who cares? He doesn't really move the needle for me. Oh, Javier Baez is still a free agent. What a shock. What an absolute shock. Nassim Nunez has, you know, can't, can't do crap. Um, with the bat, I should say. Like, he has a 65 eye. Does he just stand up there with the bat on his shoulder? That's probably the right move. When you hit with 30 contact, 35 gap, and 20 home run, you should just stand there with the bat on your shoulder and just try to take as many walks as you can. 
So yeah, that, that deal's out the window, or that idea is out the window, I should say. There was one other guy I've been looking at that I thought maybe could fit. And it's Jonathan India, and it's for a very specific role. It's for the short side platoon. Um, let's see what he made last year. So he's coming off a $19 million season. I don't think we'd have to pay him anywhere near that. In fact, I have talked with him a bit. He's not up there. Problem is, he just, he just falls short in, in the defensive area to be kind of a, a utility type. So really what I'd be looking at him for is to kind of back up O'Neill Cruz against righties and then maybe start against lefties. But then I start comparing him to Arelvis Martinez and I'm like, is he really better? Especially for the money. And for me, it's like, I think I'm just trying to spend the money at this point, which I think has some merit to it. But is is India worth it? Like he's he's better. India is better than Arelvis. But it's 13 mil versus league min. And at that point, I'm just like, I don't know. I guess, excuse me, if it's if it's a one year deal, it's fine because then it's coming off. Next, because here's the thing, as I cut myself off, when we look at our projected for next year, it goes up 20 mil just with the ARB estimates and guys making more money and the Tariq Skubal contract, he's gonna go up three mil. If he doesn't opt out. Ooh, I forgot that that was a player opt out. That's interesting. But anyway, like we're slated to go up. So I don't wanna do anything long-term, but if I do a single year, it spends some of the money. Cause again, you don't wanna leave for those that don't really know what I'm talking about here with saying we got to spend this money so that Illich doesn't just take it from us. If you have a ton of money on hand all the time, your owner's going to be like, well, you don't need this then. So I'll just, I'll take this back. And so that's what I don't want to happen. I'm actually going to throw a few extra bucks in the draft budget, just in case there's like a, an impossible or something, right? Because we have this money right now, we could maybe utilize this draft to take some chances and try to leverage um, some leverage our extra money into some prospects because we still have a terrible system and I made it way worse with the Skeens deal. We are 29th out of 30. We have one guy barely holding on to top 100. That's Chagoya at 99. We've got four in the next 100, ranging from 141 to 166. But it's it's light, y'all. It's very light. So we can do the India move. Problem is, who who goes? Because it can't be Workman. It can't. Workman has to back up short uh, at the very least, if not also second. Like, I could maybe stretch India at second, but I don't want him to be our backup shortstop. I really, really don't. And I don't want Brooks Lee backing up short because you don't want a starter to back up um, a key position like that. Pacheco has 50 range, so I don't want him to be the guy. It's it's a tough decision right now, y'all. And I'm just not entirely sure what the best measure is. So, hmm. The, the, the thing of it is, is Pacheco, Martinez, and India are all the same class of guy. Pacheco's a lefty, the other two are righties. Oh man, I don't know. I, cause I, I, I don't know who to get. We have, we have 14 hitters. Like this is the team right now, I think. So then it would probably have to be a Relvis, but he's out of options. So then you're thinking Pacheco, but he's too good to send down. He's 25. He's, he's, he's ready to show what he can do. He's better than a Relvis. So maybe we maybe we are at a point where we don't have to just go with the cheapest guy. We can actually say, "Hey, we'll just we'll spend the money on the better player and Arelvis can just be a backup." Let me see what happens if I shop him. What I'm trying to gauge here is the interest in him if I tried to get him through waivers. Okay, it's light, but there are a couple of interesting players here. At least a couple greens. 
making some money too. It's Taj Bradley, who's not a terrible starter, but he's making 20, 23, and 23. So this is a money dump. And then Brandon Isert, who we've seen again with the Jays. And he's making, oh, he's making big money. Nine, 12, and then 20 for two years. So that's why that's why he's here. And I'm on deck in my fantasy draft. So can't do it. Can't do that. I can't commit to that ICER deal. That means like there is some interest in Arelvis. He probably wouldn't make it through. God, I just don't know what to do. Because then you go look at the pitching, by the way. And we're at 13 here. We have to get to 12. We still have one, two, three, four. We have four guys that are out of options. That's actually an improvement. I want to say we had six last year. But I don't even know who to get rid of off of this as is right now. Is it Miguel Guerrero? I mean, he's pretty good. Does he really need to be sent out? Maybe he's sent out to... Um, to start in the minors. I don't know. The problem here too is I was gonna say another potential option to spend some of this money would be an, a move I made with Montreal way back when. Those of you remember my, my Twitch Expos series, it was around this time, early February, a certain, a certain closer was lingering out there. It was this man, Edwin Diaz. And we took a shot on him and it blossomed into an amazing, amazing time with him. He just became, I mean, not became, he, he remained or elevated uh, himself. Like he was already one of the best relievers in the game and he just, he was next level with us in Montreal. And like, I, I think I mentioned this last episode, we were doing the, the Narcos song all the time. It was great. And he's been a God here for the Mets. So he's gonna be good wherever he goes. Do we do a luxury item there for one year? And we just give him the one year, make him the closer. Because that, that's exactly what it was with um, with Montreal was, hey, we've got this money. We don't want to let it go to waste. Let's, let's sign Edwin Diaz. I guess if we do that, then maybe we try to send Wilmer Flores out. Do we think he would make it? 45, 60, 60. I feel like he'd get picked up if I waved him though. I really do. Let's see what a shop does with him. All right, it's a little more. Um, okay, seeing a couple of these names actually reminds me of something else I want to get into. So, Let's table this for a moment because I see this guy Colson Montgomery here for the White Sox. He is coming off of three straight five, six win seasons. It's five, 5.8, 5.6. So it's, you know, we, we round. So it's five, six, and six, just a stud. But it seems like they're getting some regret with this deal they signed him to. And I, I understand it's five years, 161 mil. It's 13, 26, 36, 44, 44. Now, if he's churning out five win seasons, sure, he's worth that. But that's five years from now that we'd have to bet on him holding up. The reason it reminds me of something though was, we have this guy. His name is Jack Clark. Now, I don't know if I've talked about him in the last episode or not. Pardon me, I meant to go back and uh, scrub the last episode to see if I did. But it's been on my notes to uh, bring him up to y'all. I was looking at him before we signed Rick Hahn. So when we had nobody. So you get OSA ratings. OSA loves this dude. They think Jack Clark is a G. They got him as a 55 with a 70 potential. The only thing he does is strike out. They got him for 55 contact, 60 gap, 60 homer, 70 I, and 45 avoid K. He's coming off a big three win season. Actually, back, back to back to back three win seasons. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. 2026 was a six win season. He just put up three war at both high A and double A. 
So he's one of these performance monsters right now. Han doesn't really believe it. Like, this isn't a bad profile that Han has. He says, oh, he's a solid player, but he's not a god. So my thinking was, should we try to float this guy out and see if anybody in the rest of the league values him the way OSA does? The first run through I did with him brought up Colson Montgomery, Brandon Isert, Lars Dupar, three interesting guys. Um, but I, I figured out the rub on Montgomery because when I first looked at him, I was like, why are they offering Montgomery? Should I take a five, six win guy from a division rival? Then I saw the money and I was like, no, I can't do that. Same kind of with Isert. Let's go back to Isert real quick. He's more affordable-ish, but even, I mean, 20 for two years for a, a true reliever too. He does have 35 stand, but it's a low 35, right? Don't forget that these are rounded numbers um, to the nearest five, but he's he's probably closer to 30 stamina than he is 35. Be, because, and the reason we know that is because his role is bullpen. He doesn't have starter or borderline. And I figured out a way to get a better handle on that, y'all. It's a little trick. Maybe this is cheating. Um, you all let me know what you think about this. I'm not going to do this all the time. But if you go to the 1 to 100 scale, you see that it's a 24 stamina out of 100. Well, that makes sense why he doesn't have a starter tag. Let's go to one of our guys who's a bullpen guy that can... Well, let's go with Weens, right? He's a 35 on the 2080 scale, but he actually has 43 stamina, so he can be a legitimate starter. So that's one way to kind of see where they're at on that 35 range, if you prefer to use the 2080. It might be a case to use the, the one to 100 though, but I, I'm, I just love the 2080, I'm just so used to it. I can look at a player and have a good idea that I'm probably not gonna change. Even though in Perfect Team, I use the one, the one to 100. So I guess it's just, I'm used to it in the two different settings that they're in. But anyway, Icer never has a chance to start. And I will say, if he was more like Weens, where his true stamina was like a 44 out of 100, and there is a world where we could have started him, I might have done that deal for Clark. Even with the 20 mil on the two, I would have tried to get him to eat some of it, but it would have been something I would have at least been open to. But as it stands now, it's, it's too difficult. Let me see how much they would eat. Oh, they wouldn't even do it straight up anymore. Never mind. They're out on this. Let me put 40%, make this work. Uh, I mean, them eating 40%, we do have to throw in another guy, but it's not crazy. We've got uh, Jorge Rosales here an international free agent signing from 2024 decent catcher with high adaptability work ethic 55 ability 60 potential home run power 60 potential eye so that's a piece you know that's something but then we've also got uh chris allen here who we got in the was this he was in the weens deal and he's a prospect you know nice outfielder great personality i don't really want to deal him but like i could what if i put in allen and i make them eat more Oh, wait, no, they're already out. The second I add another dollar, they're like, don't. We will not do that. Um, What if I take it to 60 and then throw that up? All right, then we have to go with another, like, pretty big piece. And then this starts to get a bit unruly. And do we really have the system to be trading two 20-something outfield prospects, even if they're not high-end? Let me shop Clark again, because it's been over a month of game time since I did it. Let's see what the rest of the league thinks while I take a drink. All right, so Montgomery is back. And I say back because I've done three runs of this. He was in the first, not in the second, and now he's back in the third. Maybe the, um, maybe the Adamus signing made them more willing to do it. What if I make them eat a straight up 50% here? Nope, they would want a stud. And don't forget, that's our old friend Scott Harris running the show over there. Ah, that's probably why he liked Adamus. Damn it. I should have known. Anyway, I don't think we're going to do anything like that. 
Pena, Jeremy Pena, making 14 and then 16, 16. He's got the defense that we're looking for. It's a really rough bat. Let's scout him real quick. He's 30. He's coming off a 92 WRC plus. Problem is the year before that was 49. And I do think with this bat, that's his range. From like, you know, basically 50 to 100, which is a tough range. I mean, this is, this is a bottom out in 2026 like that that's not gonna happen very often but he's probably gonna live like 70 to 95 somewhere in there but he could be our utility guy with the defense and then we send workman back out i don't know but let's see what the what the report says when he comes back james outman make a lot of these are money dumps so some teams are interested, but only if they can get rid of money. Oswaldo Cabrera doesn't cost anything. He's only got 55 range. He's somebody I really like in real life. Switch hitter, infield, outfield. I get him a lot in Sims because of my real life fandom. Let's at least scout him. Kind of see what's up there. Let's do this. Let's do infielders and run it back here. Sorry, we've been getting this freezing cold weather, and I'm like, I've got like a little toddler sniffle here. Been driving me nuts. We got Gavin Lux here. His defense isn't great. This is another guy I'm a big fan of in real life. Can't wait for him to come back. I, I had him for such a breakout year last year when he ripped his knee. I was so bummed. Uh, I'll put a scout out on him. He's only 55 range, so he doesn't really fulfill that that utility infielder up the middle guy that I'm looking for. But he's only making 10 mil this year and next. Maybe, maybe if the scouting report comes back and uh, Han sees things, you know, sees a few pluses with him, maybe, because he's also a captain. So he could be kind of our poor man's Adamus. Bryson Stott, he's actually making too much. 15, 18, 18. So he's making even more than Pena. I think it would be Pena or Lux. Pena, Lux, or Cabrera. I, I could maybe do one of them. What about AJ, uh, CJ Abrams? He's only 50 range. That's the tough part for him. He's only making 7.7 .7 and he's a free agent. Let's at least scout. So we're not going to trade Clark right now, but at least we got some scouting out there. We'll see what these guys look like. Okay, so we got the Skeens deal. We got the Clark. Oh, I wanted to show you all a couple other things. So Washington, I was going to say, let's go back to the Nats with CJ Abrams, but I forgot. He's on Arizona. How'd, the, how'd he get there? What was the trade? For Dylan Ray and Luis Ramirez. A couple 50s. All right, but let's go to the Nats. I actually know. Wait a minute. What the hell? What the hell's going on, y'all? Oh, oh, I'm a moron. I'm a moron. Sorry. I had it labeled wrong in my thing. Uh, I had it labeled that Washington flips Derek Curiel right after we trade him. No, it's the Dodgers. The Dodgers are who we traded him to, and they flipped him shortly after we dealt him. A month, literally a month later, they dealt him to Washington. Sorry, so the, the what the hell there was on my note, not, uh, not the game. I was very confused. I was like, I thought Washington traded him. No, no, they traded for him from the Dodgers. So the Dodgers, who seemed really keen on Curiel um, in that Wilman Diaz deal, like he was a big piece of that, they turn around and say, nope, we're going to take him, David Cordero, who has some juice, not, not a bad prospect here at 21. Like, you can see a path to some okay hitting. Uh, not much of a fielder, though, so he's whatever. And Kevin Hershkowitz, Hershkowitz who is definitely a throw-in type, for Jose Ferrer. A premium reliever. 70 stuff, 50 movement, 65 control. I mean... I mean, he's a 30 stamp, so he is a legit reliever. 
but he's super high upside. He didn't have a good year. 537 ERA, 146 whip in 52 innings. And that was coming off of a really good 2026, but then a really rough 2025. So three three major league seasons, two bad, one good. The Dodgers say, hey, we can fix this 28-year-old and make him good. Okay, well, we'll see. That's interesting. I don't know. I think uh, I think I like Washington's outlook on that one. With Kirill and Cordero. I mean, I liked Kirill. He was tough to give, but we didn't need outfield as much. He's a 70 range. Now his bat is pretty weak. He's probably going to cut a pretty similar figure to uh, Parker Meadows. So that's not like a game changer. That is worth a, a top end reliever. So it's fine. It's a fair deal. But anyway, I just wanted to bring up that uh, Kirill is no longer in LA. And then we got offered a deal. And they came to us twice offering us this guy, a guy that we had been interested in. But I feel comfortable where we are on this front. So I'm curious what y'all think. Jonah Heim was offered to us and he's a cub now. So they were very motivated to move him. The Rangers were, and they eventually found their taker. But they came knocking on our door because we had asked for him. Um, we had a team need as catcher. So it was clear that we would be in the market and they came knocking. And it wasn't, it wasn't a terrible offer, but in the end, I decided not to do it because I like our catcher setup, but he's a 70 ability, you know, leader adaptability work ethic, 55 home run, 55 avoid K, um, and then a bunch of 50s and 45s elsewhere, coming off of two horrendous offensive seasons, but still worth about a win to a win and a half because of that defense. Problem is he's making 25 mil. Actually, for the Cubs, he ain't making a damn thing. Wow, so they're going to eat 100% for them. Okay, they were only offering us to eat like 60% of it. So what'd they give? They had to give Jeff Dion, who's a gap god, a contact gap god with great outfield defense. Okay, so, you know, a, a little piece there. Ethan Bradbury. Does Ethan Bradbury? Extreme ground baller. An okay pitcher. You know, borderline starter. So in between that starting relieving threshold, currently listed as a starter. Let's see what he becomes if you make him a reliever. His stuff goes up to 55. What was it? I actually didn't pay attention. Oh, it goes up five. Okay. Um, his nickname is Super Like, which is funny. Isn't that, um, isn't that something on uh, social media? You can super like something. Is that, am I, am I drunk? I think that's where that comes from. I don't know, I'm not gonna look it up. Who gives a shit? Y'all can tell me. And then um, Miguel Blaise was the other piece, who is a big time prospect for the Red Sox in real life and has carried that over. Like he has big time outfield, good speed, moderate hitting, but with a 40 I, 40 avoid K, he has an uphill battle. He is coming off a 1.2 war in 53 games with the Cubs. Not a bad deal for the Rangers, especially, but not a bad deal for the Cubs either, especially since Haim is free financially. So he costs those three players, but they don't pay him a dime. I don't mind it. So what they wanted with us was I think they were offering 60%. I think it'll have canceled out here, but let me see if I can even find the email. Oh no, they were only retaining 15%. Oh, this was a different deal. Here's the one. Okay, maybe they weren't eating jack shit. It was probably me getting in there and working it. That's what it was. Okay, so they came up and offered us straight up Heim for Ashby. That's not a terrible offer. The bottom line, y'all, before I go in into Ashby, I guess a little bit more, is just that I, I'm comfortable with Bailey and show. I, I think I just want to run with that right now. I just like, what were we going to do? We could have kicked Bailey to the curb, I guess. He wasn't great last year, so maybe that would have been the right move. But I was fine just sticking with him, especially because I'm trying to think. Well, I, I, it won't be in the pending deals anymore. Maybe I wasn't able to get them to eat the money, and that's why I, I balked because we were going to have to pay the 25 mil. That would have been one way to spend our money though. And it would have been short term. Maybe I should have done it. But anyway, I look at Ashby and still a legit starter. 
We have him for another year after this at potentially 13 mil as a team option. And don't forget the Brewers are always eating 40% of everything. So it just felt like if Haim had been hitting a little bit better, I mean, first off, maybe he's not available. I understand that. But that hitting was so, so bad. I figured we'd just stick with the guys we got. And I like having Ashby in our rotation or as a premium stopper because that takes me now to our pitching because with Skeens, who comes out of the rotation? Currently listed as the sixth starter is Ashby. And these are listed in order. Well, if they were in order of, of preference for me in, in terms of quality, I think this is the order. Skeen, Scooble, Enriquez, Stone, Weens, Ashby. I'm really intrigued by Weens. Now he's a 40 control. This might not work and Ashby might keep his spot. This is something that we're gonna have to figure out during spring, I believe. And if and if he just, you know, has like a 12, 13% or even 17% walk rate like he did in the majors last year. Sorry, I was looking at his 12% strikeout minus walk. Yeah, if he's in the 15, 16, 17% walk rate, starting in spring training then we're not gonna be able to start him this year and that's fine and then ashby will get his job in the rotation but right now he's kind of the odd man out that said with Elpedio gone ashby would just become the premier stopper and get like 110 innings out of the bullpen so that was a that was a good offer though like i, I thought that was a fair offer by the rangers i ended up not doing it curious if y'all think that was a bad idea or not all right so we're coming up on the hour here let's go through a few more things then we'll cut it and then i'll get probably through spring training and into the season well i actually i'll i'll get right up to opening day for the next episode and then we'll go through april together um but i have a few more things to cover first things first rule five draft we did take somebody we took ryan zephyrjohn from the White Sox, so we, we took from a uh, divisional opponent, throws 97-99, 40 stamina, so he's a borderline starter type, and I think it's borderline not because of the stamina, but, but because of the 45 changeup, but his other two pitches are 70s, so he's a 65-50-45 type guy. We're not going to start him anyway, but like, it, it, it'd be there if he needed a spot start. We could maybe throw him in there to do it, is basically what that's telling me. But I figure, you know, it's a live arm. Let's just take a shot and see what's up. Worst case is we don't want him. Um, he, he flops in spring and we give him back. For me, if y'all have a spot on the 40 and, you, and there's somebody you like in the rule five, take them. Take two, right? Like it doesn't make sense not to take the shots because there's no real commitment. You can just give them back. So even if you're like, ah, I don't know if I'm going to... If I'm going to keep this guy around, that's okay. Just take him and see what happens. That's basically what we did here with Zephyr Jean. Um, Okay, I did make a couple free agent moves. They were very small, but let's get into them. The first one is for a guy named Roger Planting, catcher who came over from Amsterdam. And he's got 70 ability. This was a, actually another reason. I should have uh, put this on the notes. This was another reason that I wasn't as keen on getting Heim. Now we didn't have him yet. I, this was still in the making, uh, you know, in the offer stage, but he's a 70 with 55 arm, uh, modest bat, but we saw the bat that Heim's putting up. So what the hell's the difference really? Uh, we're gonna start him in double A, but ideally if he if he does well, you know, the first month or so, we'll get him in the triple A pretty quickly. And then he's knocking on the door. And then we signed Nolan Jones to a small deal worth 1.8 mil we got to move him up you know 30 days into the season to keep him and i figured he was worth a decent shot 65 i 55 gap 50 homer 45 contact 40 avoid k i read that in a weird order basically in uh, descending order of quality but he can take some walks he can hit some gaps he plays the four corners first third left right moderately but he's also a captain i like that in triple a um, you know, kind of keep the, the troops motivated down there a little bit. He has, um, he hasn't been much of anything in Colorado because they're not playing him. He didn't get shit for time in 25 or 26. 
And uh, in 27, he played 258 plate appearances. So they've really just been parking him in the minors, which is crazy because we know how well he played in real life in 2023. And so it'd be surprising to see him spend three straight years uh, in the minors after that. But in our universe, he didn't have that 2023 season. But yeah, I figured a decent little, little gamble there. No big deal. Uh, let's see. Anything else? I mentioned the Watanabe swing. Oh, yeah. Hall of Fame. Pujols, A-Rod, and Yachty made it. Mauer just missed. He had 74%. You need 75. In the draft lottery, Miami went from 7 to 1. KC goes from 1 to 2. The Giants go from 5 to 3. The Padres go from 3 to 4. Oakland goes 4 to 5. And the Angels jump from 9 to 6. And then, oh, international amateurs. Yes. This one's simple, though, y'all. Instead of the spread it out this year, I went all in right away. Sergio Barella, 120 potential. Obviously, very, 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 very unlikely to reach that. But I just said, you know what? Let's go for the superstar off rip. I, I came in, you know, when you first click offer contract, it was like 1.7 mil. I jumped that to four immediately. He came back about it a game day or a, a, a week of gameplay later saying, oh, the Marlins offered me a bigger deal. I went all in at 585. He took it. So international was was quick and easy. And I figure, listen, you could make the case that because our system is so crappy, we could spread it out and try to take a few lottery tickets. That's fair. But I've been doing that. OK, and uh, we'll see if those those tickets start to hit. But this year, I just wanted to go all in. And so we went for the mega stud and we'll see how that turns out. So I think that's going to kind of wrap us up here on the off season. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how it went. If I could change one thing, believe it or not, the one thing I would change is getting Watanabe. I'm kind of mad. I, I really am bummed on that. I wish he'd at least given me a chance to maybe give him something like 22, 23 mil for the one year. It would have been perfect because we got all this damn money and I don't know what to do with it. We got 19 and a half mil, y'all. I just don't know. Oh, also, I've been trying to talk with Torque to uh, sign him to an extension, but he's not hes not really there. And then I had a deal that I liked. And then for some reason, even though this, so you see right here, it says money left if extension, for extension if signed, minus 5.5. The, the deal I had offered did not have a negative here, and yet the owner declined it under some reason. I don't know, he just said that's, you can't do that. I'm like, but it doesn't say minus here. Why are you preventing me? So anyway, we'll see. Uh, we need to figure out Torque though. We need to sign him to a longer term deal. So yeah, the team is, is pretty much set right now. I'd be surprised if I come back to y'all um, with a big move, but I won't rule it out. You never know. Still got a couple weeks until spring training starts. You know, an injury could strike in spring. So we'll see how it goes. But I think we're pretty much set with the team that we've got. We've got money on hand. So one last thing we could do is take a look at upcoming free agents and see if there's anybody maybe we would, we would trade for on that front. Um, let's see here. We had a stamina filter, so let's get rid of that. I mean, Bobby Witt Jr. is an upcoming free agent. But are the Dodgers going to be motivated to trade him? I doubt it. And of course, he wouldn't be a utility backup type. He would be a starter. But then Diaz could go into that utility role. Like Diaz, like if we were able to get somebody like Witt, of course, Diaz doesn't have to start. But absent bringing in somebody of that caliber, Diaz is obviously starting. No single player would make this work, obviously. I don't even know what we can do. Pacheco is literally our best potential, apparently, at 75. I don't think he's moving the needle that much. What if I do him? And I don't even know. I don't even know where I would start on this deal, so I'm not even going to do it. Because it would, it would be more than it's worth. The main reason I looked at that wasn't for a deal right now. It was uh, under the idea of like... In the middle of the season, who could be a free agent that if a team isn't doing that well, we can maybe get him. By the way, he was also just traded. So I'm not going to trade for him anyway. He was traded on December 9th. That's probably why the Dodgers didn't mind trading Diaz because they had their eyes set on wit. 
What did they give? One guy, Rocky Passion. What the fuck? This guy's not that good. I know it's only one year of win, but you gotta get more than that, KC. Oh my goodness. That's brutal. That's really brutal. Moncada has 60 range, and he's a decent hitter. But he was also just traded from Arizona to, the, to Seattle. So, you know, I do some goofy things sometimes that don't quite fit, quote unquote, real life. But I'm not going to trade for a guy a month after he was traded. Now, I know Kirill was by the computer. Um, so, you know, things like that could happen. But I don't think an established veteran player like this would get moved twice in a month. That, like, it's, Kirill is one thing, an established guy that would be kind of goofy. Oh, what about Semyon? Another real life favorite. He was just traded too. Son of a bitch. Oh man, and they paid 100%. What would they have to give? Carlos Coleman Harris? Okay. They had to give a decent up the middle guy. He can at least pick it and, and play up the middle. His bat is pretty weak. Man, they got him to pay for it too. That's kind of interesting. I wish I'd have known Semyon was available. Oh, what about J Ram? Actually, I think J Ram doesn't like us. I think he blocks it. Oh, wait, now, okay. Maybe that was a previous sim. Oh, he's on the Twins now, too. Was he just traded? Okay, everyone here was just traded. All these potential free agents were just traded. And he was traded to Minnesota. So, realistically, they would not trade him to us. They're our biggest rivals. So, I'm not even going to bark up that tree. Anyway, let's wrap this one up. Um, shit, Green's a potential free agent? Shit, they're both free agents after this year? Oh my god, I didn't realize both were. Why did I not realize that, y'all? Okay, well, we can't have that. We have to sign at least one of them. Okay, I gotta figure that out. Let's go ahead and wrap up here. Off-season's pretty much over. Um, if I can finagle something that makes sense, I'll do it. But uh, as it stands right now, maybe I sign India, and then we figure something out with Arelvis. Otherwise, this is our team, and I'm excited about it. Next episode, we will have opening day, and we will go through April together, and I'll pick you up on any uh, potential moves that I do. Anyway, go Lions. Talk to you all later. Peace.